very good evening and thank you for joining us. We're coming to you from the Serena Hotel Conference Center. And tonight uh, we'll be speaking to Brian Tumwebaze who has a story to share. Um, Brian Tumwebaze lives with the support of a pacemaker, a small battery that is placed on the left side of the chest to help control his heartbeat. And this according to his doctor Peter Luabi, a cardiologist at Mulago Heart Institute. Until the 25th of July last year, uh, Brian was working in the United Arab Emirates and he parted with his job after being admitted in a hospital as a result of cardiac rupture of the sinus of the Vasalva, a tear between the heart and aorta with a tumor inside the heart. That's a lot to take in, so Brian is going to take us through his journey. He's joined in the studio uh, by his sister, Violet Kabachaki. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Brian, for coming through. You're welcome. All right, let's say it as it is. Welcome back. Thank you for staying with us. Um, Brian, I was saying a, a number of words, I don't know, uh, cardiac rupture of the sinus of the salva, yeah. and I don't even understand what I'm talking about. What exactly are we talking about? What happened to you? I'll take you to 25th July. After work, which started a very good normal day, after work I visited my friends and came back home. Uh, it was to, they were practicing a piano. They played me my best song, Amazing Grace. Well, at home I couldn't grab sleep. I decided to watch a movie on my cell phone. This is in the UAE. In the UAE. You were staying alone? No, with roommates. Okay. Yes, we had worked. In, I had been in UAE for three and a half years. So. When I chose, I decided to watch a movie on my cell phone. I developed a simple cough at midnight, chest pain, and within the next 10 minutes, I could hardly breathe. I was rushed to the nearby hospital, NMC, where I remember, I didn't see how I went there, but I remember well there, I had doctors tell me that handle him with care and take him with care so fast, but be mindful that he could lose his life on the way. My heart, my heart rates, I had the doctor still tell the nurses that my heart rates were 20%. After three days unconscious, I woke up in a, yet another bigger hospital with so many wires on my body, on oxygen, on two drips, one on the left and on the other on the right, and Doctor, m many tests were being done. Doctors told me to keep calm, but I was so shocked and surprised how I got there, yet I had been well previously. So you, all you remember was the doctors telling the nurses or whoever to take you carefully? Yes, please. And then this is three days later, you're in a different hospital, you have tubes attached to you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then doctors say, tests pro came out that I had a rupture the sinus of the Vasalva, like it is interpreted as a tearing between the heart and the iota with a much more of the blood returning in the heart and a tumor inside the heart. From that day, that, uh, from that day I couldn't support myself to anything. I stayed in bed throughout and when my company came to the hospital, they were all surprised and shocked, but being a, a place of work, my bosses suggested I come home on the fourth day of admission. But doctors told him I can no longer bled, uh, ride on a train or fly by plane or go in a bus. My heart rates were reducing from 20 and going down. So I stayed in the hospital for one month doing tests every day, but every day I became weak and weak and weaker. I, uh, I called my family back home and told them after a week what was happening, but in the hospital I realized that I was the youngest patient in the cardiac ward. You mentioned that you were the second patient um, in that region to yeah. have this condition. Yeah. Uh, the type of condition I had, it is said to be a rare case in the world that I was the second person to have it after the first person died after surgery in 1992. 
I got this condition 2018 in July. Yes, 2019. Yes. Well, coming to 2020. Did you have any signs um, earlier on, warning signs that you might have ignored no. until that night when you put no. a cough? No, it was very fine and went for work. I tried that day was the happiest. Do, they, do, do the doctors, did they explain to you what could have caused it, what could have put you in that kind of situation? It said I was born with it and I lived as a miracle. For 26 years, well, yes. you're 27 now. Yes. For 27 years, there was a tear. So this tear started when I was, a, I think, when I was a baby, but they, they didn't realize it. And as years went on, it kept on enlarging, enlarging, to the point that when I got the heart attack, 80% or much more of the blood would return in the heart than going to the body, which is an abnormality. Okay. So they gave you a pacemaker? Yes. Tell me about the pacemaker. Well, before the pacemaker, I reached a point whereby my heart rates were 12%, and one cardiologist suggested I need to be in isolation. Or in, and the isolation was for good, not for bad. He, it was, he paid for me in VIP ward. I remember each day was 2 million Ugandan shillings. I was there for a week. The surgeon, the, the surgeon who was to operate me paid that money. He, it was one Friday, he had suggested we are going in for the surgery on Saturday, which was the next day. But on Friday evening, he came to my sick bed and told me, of course, he wasn't always coming alone. It was a, sim a team of six doctors. He told me, Brian, we need more time to read about your condition. We can't just take you in for the surgery. Not sure, because we've never done this. We are not sure of what we are going to do. but." Please give us time. Before that, he, they had come to my bed and told me, it is a rare case in the world. I either choose between staying like this and die of a massive heart attack anytime soon, or I go in for another, for, for fixing it with an open heart surgery, which they are not sure of, but they will try to do their best. So that day when my heart rates were 12, the surgeon came to my sick bed and said, Brian, we need more time. We are sorry we are not going in for the surgery tomorrow. We need more time. And which more time he asked for a week. I was scared. I told him for a week and now my heart rates are 12. Do you think I will still be alive within that one week that you've asked? He said, don't worry, we shall try our best. In my head, I was calculating the cost of you staying. That's about 14 million shillings yeah. to stay. And, and yeah, in stay. VIP ward, I, I, they brought me papers that very evening for signing from one ward to another. I saw papers of VIP and I asked who is going to pay that. They told me the surgeon is gladly paying for this. So I was there for a full week. Day one in VIP ward, my heart rates were 12. Day two, my heart rates were 10. And day three, my heart rates were 8. I was there for a full week. And when my heart rates reached 8, one, of the, one doctor of the six came and told me, Brian, how about you prepare your path of salvation? He was an Indian doctor. Uh, I didn't know him, but we had developed this friendship. It was from the time I got to know I have a rare case in the world, I chose to be happy, to smile. I would smile not because I had answers, but because I was a believer and I was in this great pain, uh, scared of what would happen and what I was going through. But yet, I saw doctors always around my bed and nurses telling me, don't worry, we are here to worry on your behalf. Being the youngest patient in the ward, being the only African in the hospital, having a rare case in the world, I as Brian, and then choosing to smile was something unique that they would bring patients on my sick bed and tell them to emulate, to do like, like me. Brian. Yeah. Had you reached out to your family by this time? Yeah, I reached out. Actually, All right, so Violet actually was actually coming to was, you. When he was admitted in the hospital, his friends, like after day two, they began now sending us messages and photos of the whole condition, but we didn't know what was going on. Okay, so he reaches out to you eventually. Who did you call? Uh, I didn't call her. 
but I was so scared of communicating home since I had not been home for the last three and a half years. So I was scared of telling them I have this complication and it is an organ. So I kept quiet for the news. When I regained my conscience, I, I found out that my friends had sent photos and told my family. I rushed so quickly to sending them messages in bold letters. Please don't tell my family back home. Don't tell mom and my grandmother. But, but for knew. her, yeah, she already knew and she insisted with the help of another sister. Without my consent, I rushed home and told everyone. What, when you found out, how did you find out? From the friends? Yeah, from the friends. They sent us photos. They even sent us messages. But they didn't really explain what was going on. So it is after some time, we have an auntie who is working there in the UAE also. When we reached out to her, she quickly ran to the hospital and talked to the doctors. That's when they told her that she had a condition of the heart and he needed a surgery quickly. So you went and told your mom? We to I told my mom like after a week because I had to gather the courage to so do it. Yeah. This whole period he's in the hospital, what are you doing on this side? On this side we are all worried. Actually one point in time we thought they were lying, he's not alive. Until when my auntie went there, he checked, he, she's like, she saw the whole situation. She's the one who calmed down now, everyone. Yeah, I did this not because I wanted, but I was so scared of delivering the news home. I would tell them I'm critically ill, on all on wires, and yet they are expecting me because I had already bought the ticket to come home for holiday that December. On okay. 20th. So this was July, you said? Yeah, this was July. How long were you in the hospital? For three months. All right. Yeah. Let's take a short break and we'll be right back. Welcome back. Thank you for staying with us. Uh, tonight we are speaking to Brian Tumwebaze who is telling us about his heart condition and how his life changed in the span of what? Was it one day? One day. One day. Not even a full day. Not a full because, day. Yeah, it was from midnight to 3 a.m. Wow. All right. So you got a pacemaker at a certain point. I want yeah. to understand how um, your life has changed with it now. Well, yeah. After the one week in VIP ward, accepting Christ because he told me to choose to prepare my path of salvation, which I did, and I was prepared for two days for the surgery, signing many papers. I accepted and called on God's will to be done. The surgery was estimated to take eight hours. It lasted for 16 hours, and on the 17th hour, was taken out of the theater. However, my heart, the surgery went on well, but my heart completely stopped. Swollen and outside with a chest open, only depending on machines. I was taken in an intensive care, whereby I was unconscious for three days. But what surprised me is when I regained my conscience, I found all the seven doctors sleeping next to my sick bed. Not on beds, but down on the, floor. on the floor. Yeah, and then I was in this great, great pain, possibly thinking I could die with many, a lot of wires on my body and tubes that I couldn't help myself or support myself to anything. I had this serious pain and I had developed bed sores on the toes and on this left ear, but doctors, the first question they asked me when I regained my consciousness was, Brian, would you like to see your heart? I was so scared of the machines, I said no, but I touched my heart and felt it. I what do you mean, wait, so let me take you back. So you're sleeping on the bed, Yeah. you wake up, and the doctors are all sleeping. What yeah. did you do? 
to get their attention? No, actually, I didn't do anything because they were there not to sleep, but they were always taking, checking. checking on me. Yeah, for me, I came regaining my consciousness. I came like from a deep sleep. I was in a place so green with calm waters and cool environment. So when I woke up, I woke up to great pain with many wires my, and helpless. All right, and that then is when I got, I had the question, would you like to see your heart? Okay. And then I said, no, I touched it. And doctors said, don't make any movement. A lot of machines on your body, any slight movement, you will kill yourself. When you say, would you like to touch your heart, it makes it seem like someone was holding your heart. No, inside. it wasn't okay. being hold, held by someone. It was on top of the chest. Not covered? Not covered. The chest was open, the heart swollen, not functioning, only depending on machines, and it was just on top of the chest. They had put something just to cover up, but the chest was open. Okay. And yeah. so what's happening after this now? Yeah. I was there, and I, I, after one week, the heart reduced. I was taken back to the theater. It was placed back inside, and the chest closed. However, they connected an artificial pacemaker, which I lived on, until the time it started failing. Uh, I lived on this pacemaker, I think, for two weeks, but I would, I, my prog progress on my health, I wouldn't, I would feel that great pain, but doctors were ever always there. Like, I couldn't last for five minutes alone. You would be crying like you're in this serious pain. A doctor come and says, Brian, if you worry, how about us who are here for you? So <laughs> after some time, yeah, and sometimes I would do it late in the night, but still a doctor will come to my bed and it's like, Brian, please don't. We are here for you. But pain was there and it was intense. How long did you spend in the hospital? Three months. Three months. Yeah. Um, and in the three months, you knew in the first week, right? Yeah. The first two days we already knew because the friends before told him you. telling us what they told exactly you. is happening. Mm -hmm. the what did told what were you doing those months then? We were here all <coughs> red, praying. Was there any fundraising that was taking place? I'm I'm trying to understand how no. you were able to take care of the bills besides the no. at doctors. that time when they told mm. us they, they had already paid the hospital bills for the surgery and all that, the company where I was working and the doctors Plus some good Samaritans that were able to help out with the hospital bill the other side. So the only time we were worried about the hospital bills the other side was when they told us he needed a pacemaker and it would cost some amount of money. They told us around 50 million. That's when now everyone started getting worried. They started trying to find ways of how to collect the money, but were fortunate enough that the other side, a good Samaritan also offered the pacemaker. The pacemaker. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So your initial bill was what, 300 million? 300 million Ugandan shillings. Um, the system there is they treat and billing comes in later at their, like upon discharge. So I, well in the, excuse me, when they suggested I need a permanent battery or pacemaker, I told the doctor, I asked how much and he told me 75 million. Ugandan shillings. I told him, doctor, I can't get this money and my family can't afford this. Besides, we have a pending bill. He said, don't worry. But being a rare case in the world while going in for surgery, uh, it was all over the news. The media was there. It was in Gulf News on TV. So Paul read about this African young boy who had a heart condition and being the second in Asia. So one, it was one evening, one, good, one man, I should say one good Samaritan somewhere, was seated with my doctor, I think they are friends. He asked, what does, how is the African we read in the news? And he said, <laughs> he's getting better but gently, however he needs a permanent pacemaker. And this kind-hearted man asked how much, told him 50 million, he sent for a checkbook and wrote a check of 50 million on condition take it to the hospital, tell him not to, don't give him my address, don't uh, tell him not to call me or my name, just tell him to pray for me. So till today I'm praying for a good Samaritan. You don't know who he is? I don't know. Wow. And when the doctor brought that, 
I, he told me, we have 50 million. I was so excited, but then I asked doctor where are we going to get the more 25 million. This is a different doctor for the pacemaker. There were seven. So the other one after surgery, his work was done. He didn't come back. So this one of the pacemaker, he told me, don't worry, on this 50 million, I will do something that you will have to forget. So as we're still discussing, of course, I could say like one word and I get tired, oxygen is doubled. He's, he sent for hospital administrators, told them from his salary that I deduct 25 million and add it on my battery. I told him, doctor, how will I ever repay? You said, please don't, just pray for me. That is a huge how debt of kindness and prayers to pay. All God's favor. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, that's how I got the pacemaker. I stayed in the hospital for more, but when I got to know, like when I knew that we've got the money and I saw the pacemaker itself, I was extremely excited to the point that I blacked out in the, uh, at night on, only to wake up uh, after one week with a pacemaker planted. So you're not supposed to, be, to get excitable? When no. you were coming up the stairs, you was sort of... I'm not supposed to be overexcited, okay. anxious, stressed, or distressed. Okay. Everything makes me tired. Any imbalance in that triggers heart attack. And I know you're constantly wearing a shawl. Yeah. And you were telling me earlier you can't wear closed shoes. Yes, this is... Um, it's cold, and when it's cold, I'm, I catch infection, which is said that it could run so fast on wires of the pacemaker and could probably about like kill me in a shortest time. So everything, like life changed. I get so cold easily, not supposed to be in very cold places, extremely hot places. I don't put on closed shoes because my feet get hot. Even if in open shoes, but at least. Okay. Yeah, than closed shoes. So after three months, I was discharged. You came back home? Not, I didn't come straight away. I was discharged and they brought the bill of 300 million Ugandan shillings. Not inclusive of the pacemaker and the VIP, VIP ward. Yeah, I, I told the administrator that I don't think we can ever get this money at home. He was like, don't worry, you're the happiest patient in the hospital, you don't deserve to be sad. So it was, Three, within three days, I, I got news that doctors, nurses, and hospital administrators had cleared this bill to zero balance, all because I was their happiest patient and they feel I need this second chance. Till they didn't give me like quotation or like a list of who paid how much and who exactly, but I just received the good news it's a team of doctor of administrators with doctors who came to my bed singing songs of joy. Did you spend any money in the hospital the, for those three months? No, I didn't spend any money at all. Uh, when I well in the hospital, doctors would ask for what I need, but of course I didn't want anything because sitting, talking, eating, sleeping, everything made me tired. So. Uh, only friends visited for a short time, but of course I, they couldn't talk because I was extremely tired. They would say like, hello, and that is enough for a day. Nurses, nurses would promise to take me out like today, out, out of my sick bed. But I would be anxious, and by the time I reach outside, I'm already tired, they bring me back to my sick bed. Uh, there is a church, Lorian Church I used to go to there, and it is that very month that I had committed myself to start uh, worshiping with them, like on the worship team. And actually, when the day he felt sick, that is where he had gone to listen to the organist practice. So those members of the church always visited, but for a short time. I remember two, two of them, that was a lady, a Fil Filipino lady and a man, they would come to the hospital every day. Since my auntie was working three hours away from where I'm staying, she has this transport and her job, the boss wouldn't understand 
there it is all about work. You can't ask for an off every day. Yeah. How, when, at what point did you come back home? And when you got back to your home house in the UAE, yeah. you were being taken care of by your friends, yeah. your roommates. Uh, after discharge and news of the bill being paid, and they told me to not to go home where I was staying in UAE, but to be in a hotel, not to be in contact with anyone, not to shake hands, not to talk for so long, and not to eat any food I come across. Only diabetic diet, fiber foods, less fat, strictly less fat or no salt, uh, less or no salt, and less fat. So you went with to a hotel? daily medication. No, I couldn't go in a hotel because my company, after realizing that I will go through all this sickness and the surgery, they terminated me on the first month of admission in Iranian hospital. So after, upon discharge, I had overstay for two months. I just got to know it when I'm heading home. And I couldn't check in the hotel because my visa had been canceled. My ID had been canceled. I couldn't access anything. So I, they, they told me to proceed to the hotel, but there's no way I could check in. So I went back to my home in UAE, to my, to the, yeah. to my room, yeah. And while there, after one week, I developed another heart attack, and I was brought back to the hospital. Doctors said it was uh, food poison. I would eat food. I wouldn't eat on time. I ate every food. I came about chili food, and I miss like I didn't follow what the doctors had told me. I would sleep in bed sheets for two days, and that it was supposed to be strictly one day, and many people who would come to visit me. So that was also another story. For one week, I called my company that I'm admitted, readmitted, and the first question they asked me is, "Who told you to fall sick again?" Uh, as I hadn't yet answered that, the next question was, who told you to go back there? Yet it's the doctor who sent me a message that early morning and asked, how, how are you? I told him, doctor, we didn't sleep the entire night. They sent an ambulance. Sorry to go picked. back. Yeah. All right, let's take another short break and we'll pick up from there when we return. <laughs> Welcome back. Thank you for staying with us. I was, I, was, I was just listening to miracles along the way until we get to the part where you are terminated by your workplace. Did you at least get benefits? Did you get anything? No, I didn't get anything and I didn't have room to claim for this because they terminated me the first month of admission. I was in the hospital for three months. By the time I left the hospital, I couldn't walk or talk well. So I couldn't have helped myself to the police station. And on top of that, I already had fame there of overstay since my papers had been canceled. So my doctors were like, Brian, we've done our best. We've paid our bill, all the bills. Like what I, I told you, the second readmission, they didn't pay. And the bill of four million was brought to my sick bed. My company didn't pay at all and couldn't answer my calls. An administrator called me to his office, got four million Ugandan shillings, and said, Brian, you don't deserve to be sad. He paid the money cash and gave me a zero balance receipt and told me, now that your company is not cooperative, we've done our best. Please, how about you consider going back home? That is what happened. And when I reached the airport, I had fain of overstay since my company had terminated me without my notice and I, I stayed there for more two months whereby I paid around two million. But I'm happy that my church where I used to go to had sent me off with three million. So I paid two million there. And then after paying for that overstay, I couldn't check in on another checkpoint because I didn't have a certificate to fly. I went to process it back at the hospital. It would have been work for the company because they woke up one evening at seven and told me tomorrow at five, we exp you're supposed to go to the, ho to the airport. The driver will drop you, only carry 20 kilograms with you. And this was your company? 
yeah. which had terminated you, but yeah. they got you a plane ticket yes. home. Yes. Okay. Were you able to walk at this time or to do anything for yourself? I could. I wasn't that able, but since I realized it's me who has to be strong for myself, and if at all I want to leave this second chance, I have to try and give, in, give it all my best to go, to go through this. Okay. So I tried. So you didn't have a certificate and they sent you yeah. back? Yeah, I went back to the hospital and I was still processing the certificate. The plane left me. Okay. Yeah, my f yet my family had already reached the airport to wait for me, and some had traveled from Fort Porto, but uh, God helped me that when I called doctors, one gave me the certificate, not because I was really fit to fly, but because they saw I have to go home, and the certificate also was being paid for close, it was 800,000. So all the money I had was used there. I remember coming back to Uganda, with 600,000. I who had not been home for three months. But I'm grateful for, three years, for three years and a half. I'm grateful that when I reached here, I managed to reach because the doctors told me if you complain in the plane of any illness or any disturbance, our licenses will be taken away from us because they will say you are not able to fly. So I made sure that um, I reached Uganda so, but, and we, I remember when we reached Uganda, I didn't see who exactly was at the airport. It surprised me, I even saw flowers after two days at <laughs> home. <laughs> All right, you didn't see anything. What did you see at the airport? Were you there? Yeah, I was there. I picked him up personally. At that time, he couldn't walk. He couldn't even breathe properly. I remember we had to run to Entebbe Hospital for first aid. They gave him oxygen. Then we had to proceed to Kampala, but it was not easy because he was someone who left with his weight all like he was fat, looking healthy. He was so small, couldn't breathe. He was all coughing. He couldn't walk properly because I remember that time I had some friends around. They even helped me carry at one point in time. How much did you weigh, you said? Yeah, I came, uh, when I came to Uganda was last year in October, I weighed, I was 26 years and I weighed 30 kilograms. With my heart rate 20%. He was really small, like you could see. So you took him to Entebbe to a hospital? Yeah. yeah. And how long were you there for? We were there like for three hours because the, doc the doctor told him he needed <coughs> some oxygen to enable him to breathe properly. Then he told us to come to Kampala and the next day we had to go to the Heart Institute at Mulago. Okay, so there began your journey. At Mulago, Mulago. Heart Institute. Okay, so Where would what's visit? it been like? Yeah, I would visit Mulago Heart Institute twice or thrice a week. Uh, I had a problem of insufficient oxygen, like since my heart had struggled with a sickness for 26 years, so it, it started working, and after surgery, it started working like that of a baby, from 1%, 2%. And by the time I came to Uganda, it was 20%. The battery giving, the pacemaker giving in 80%. Uh, and so in Mulago Heart Institute, we would go there because I was disturbed by fluids. They would cover up the lungs and I could hardly breathe. Mm. For so many times, even before Mulago Heart Institute, we were moving from clinic to clinic searching for oxygen. So it's been tough ever since I came, but I'm... Oh, oh, I'm, I'm going to ask about the bill because... Mm. So you, you'd made some money while you were in the UAE. Yes. And I'm sure you had plans for that money for when you came back. Yes, please. But really, you didn't get anything. So yeah. you're back home and you have hospital bills because you're going to the Heart Institute. Yeah. What are the bills like? Yeah, in U well in UAE, I couldn't come home because if you don't go home, you're paid annual leave, salary, full salary. So I had accumulated my salary and all the other be benefits. I wanted to come here, construct for my mom a house in one, within one month of my vacation. And, but it was so unfortunate that I didn't receive all that money. However, I'm grateful to go Any of that money? Any. Okay. Yeah, when I reached here, from the day I arrived in Uganda till today, I'm depending on family, friends, and well-wishers for all the support needed. 
So it's really been tough. Sometimes you have to face it. At times there is no medication. I'm on daily medication worth one million every month. And some of this medication is not on Ugandan market. We have to send for it from Kenya. Uh, it was unfortunate that when I reached here, the type of pacemaker that I have, I'm the only one with it in the country because it is very latest model. They, it can't be interrogated in Mulago Heart Institute, yet it is supposed to be programmed basing on your heart rates. So they have to program it every... Before, it was every two weeks, every one month. Uh, now it's two months. So for so long we waited uh, at Mulago Heart Institute promising to bring us a machine. They didn't bring it. So we contacted St. Jude, the manufacturers of the pacemaker. They told us two nearby centers, which is in Kenya and South Africa, so we chose Kenya. I used to travel to Kenya every month, not by road because everything made me tired. We would go by plane and all that money was, it was always five million every month. I'm traveling to wow. Nairobi and we traveled every month. But friends, family and relatives, actually she started up a WhatsApp group out of like my knowledge I didn't know. From the day I heard of it, I was so mad and small. People think I'm from abroad and now there's a WhatsApp group with a name Save Brian, but it helped us raise that money. Until today it's active and other small groups are still running. That is how we've raised the money. So I reached a time and my heart rate increased. Actually I'm grateful to God that February this year, I celebrated 27th birthday and my heart rates uh, increased from 20% to 50%. That is by June. Yeah, I got that in June. With at least a, a good improvement on my health, like physically, yeah. I'm now 70 kilograms from- From 30. From 30. Yeah, and doctors tell me I should maintain this. So it was a great achievement for me to have all this, to start walking, talking as fast as I'm talking, all this I learned it in Uganda. Why I'm trying to speak so fast is because I get tired easily. I don't want the interview to end before I finish the story. <laughs> all right, we have a few minutes to go. Yeah. Do you, um, are you in touch with the doctors from the UAE? Yes, please, we talk on mobile calls and we I maintained my WhatsApp number so we keep chatting there but the best they can do is to advise me to see the cardiologist around because all this needs me when I'm around the treatment okay. like the battery is interrogated when you're around I but I'm grateful that people good Samaritans my family has been there for me so much more and than and friends and relatives and well wishers Fa um, what it's what's it been like trying to to get this kind of support for him it's really been hard because you have to call people you have to make whatsapp groups sometimes I'm on Facebook yeah, it's really hard and... But you've made some headway? Yeah, and we still really need the support because the treatments cost me like one million every month. Then he has also to go to Nairobi for programming. That's another five million. Yeah, like every two months. That's re it's really hard, but we thank God we've reached well. Uh, I, I, I think we were talking earlier and you mentioned you've had three heart failures in a month. Yeah. Last month. Last month, uh, the uh, doctors say I shouldn't be overexcited, anxious, stressed, or distressed. Any imbalance in my emotions triggers heart attack. So for last month, uh, my family actually they suggested I travel. I try Fort Porto. For so long, I had not been to my home ever since I arrived. I've been in Kampala because Fort Porto is considered cold. And when I reached there, I was excited to be back home. The next morning, I was admitted in the hospital because of heart attack, out of, due, of excitement. excitement. Yeah, and the other morning was another heart attack because of the cold weather. But why I'm in Fort Porto is there. I've been trying to share my story in different places, churches, um, 
uh, organizations and supportive groups to not only for financial assistance, but I, it was always my desire to tell my story for, to people going through tough times, at least to, to, for hope and inspiration. I don't like people to look at me with misery, rather a beacon of hope. I feel because like I'm wearing the wrong face now. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. Being the first time for you to, to hear this, excuse me, you, of course you can't believe. But why I smile this much and I am this jolly is I want really people to know that God is real. Indeed, he has better plans for us. I know what it means by being sick and being alone in a foreign country. And at some point I thought I would pro possibly die because everything was going on standstill. But I'm grateful that I had the right people around me. Those who always encouraged me, telling me you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. And if those doctors, really? Yes. Um, but is this sustainable, this about six million shillings every month? Yeah, and uh, we reached a time temple, yeah. and it changed like my, when my heart rates improved, doctors gave us two, two months. Yeah, so for that two months, we, doctors said, at, uh, when I, uh, I, with time, my heart will stabilize. If at all, I take my medication on time, visit the cardiologist on time, um, like with heart patients, everything you feel, you have to see the cardiologist. Yeah. yeah, so when they say when I visit the cardiologist on time and take my medication, as well as following instructions from the cardiologist, I will reach a time and it's not two months, it is maximally three months for every interrogation and my heart rate will stabilize, I go back to normal and possibly they move on with my goals. They told us even that time some of the medicines will have to be removed. Okay. Yeah, yeah. you will have to survive on two, three like that. Right. You don't work currently? Uh, apparently I don't work. So you're relying on the good graces of, you know, good True. Samaritans yeah. and, and your family? True. All right. Um, Violet, would you like to give us your final thoughts on our conversation? Yeah, thank you so much for this opportunity you've given us to share this story. It is really encouraging. Even me, it was hard for me at first, but as time went on, I'm getting used to the whole situation. The only challenge I'm having is finance, but God willing, we shall be there. Well, thank you for coming with him to support him and you know you've been there You're since the since October yeah, last since October. Yeah, when I arrived. Yeah. Okay and what would you like to leave us with? Yeah uh, first is appreciation to family friends and everyone who has been there for me my sister who took me in and at some time I thought maybe I'm becoming a burden because everything was being done for me I'm not supposed to carry anything beyond five kilograms I, some, I don't wash, but she would even lead me to the washroom and I, was, I thought maybe I'm um, tiring her, she would possibly one day say, <laughs> leave me, but she has always been there and everyone who is going through tough times out there, please know you're not alone. They, we have someone who loves us most and that is God and he has better plans for us all. Would you like to say something, maybe they're watching, to the person who paid for that pacemaker, the people yeah. in the UAE that supported you? To my doctors, well-wishers, and all those who were there for me when I was going through this, I don't have enough words or right words to appreciate you, but just know day by day I pray for you. May God bless you and enlarge your ter territories, feeling where you go. And everyone, because the, there is also another life started, in Uganda when I reached here without money yet helpless for everyone who has contributed everyone watching this not only doctors but heart patients it could be other people going through other tough times not only heart patients but long illnesses and uh, other challenges in life please just know God is there and he cares for us all, all right. thank you so much Brian I admire your strength and I'll try to smile a little bit more um, thank you very much for coming to, to talk to us, share your story, and encourage uh, whoever is listening or watching that might have uh, an experience. Thank you so much, and thank you to our viewers. Thank you for watching the show. Coming up is NTV Weekend Edition.